All right, g'day, g'day. Welcome back to Collectivitis, the podcast where we dissect the disease that is collectivism. My name's Pietro. This is Floyd. How you doing, What's Floyd? Up? I'm good. I'm good. I'm feeling I'm feeling a bit shamed though that I'm I'm might be a racist. Why might you be a racist? Well, because the voice didn't pass. Oh, wow. Did you vote no? I don't have to tell you how I voted, Pietro. <laughs> you don't have to. I'm I'm asking out of the just out of curiosity. Did you vote no? Well, I voted kinda, right? Because like sixty percent of me was racist, but forty percent of me wasn't. So I was a bit just like, oh, what do I do? So I just said, like, yeah, like kinda. Yeah. Well, the, the perfect the perfect Australian then the sixty yeah. percent racist, forty percent bleeding heart. Um, yeah. Well, I, I voted. I voted no, um, not because of any of the constitutional reasons that we spoke with um, Professor James Allen for. No, I, I, I am racist. So, uh, oh, okay. I've never had. I've never had a chance to like actually vote. I am racist before. I, people keep calling me racist for the things yeah. I vote. Yeah, um, yeah. And it doesn't matter how much shouting of yes, I am racist. I do. They, mm. they, they always use it as if it's an insult. Like, no, I'm, I'm telling you, I, yeah. I am racist. I finally got to vote on it. So I, I yeah, was you need thrilled. to put it on paper. Like I need a record of my racism. Like, here you go. I racist. was confused by the question because I almost voted yes. Cause I thought the question was, are you racist? Oh, and then okay. I had to read the question and they, they found a weird way to word it. So it wasn't exactly yeah. that question, but uh, it turns out no was the way you were right. Ra- anyway. Uh, I'm, great still, I'm still for struggling. I'm still struggling with my racism. What is it called? That that idea that you're a racist, but you don't know it. So, I think it's finally <laughs> letting me know that. Wait a second. I might be a racist. <laughs> Internalize uh, racism. Yeah, yeah. Well, today's today's a great day because I mean we're talking about uh, how racist we are, and we also get to talk about how anti-Semitic we are because my my goodness, the world is a uh, is wild right now. So Double I very trouble. rarely get to be both racist and anti-Semitic on the same I know. day. So I know it's, this Ooh. is just like, this is like Christmas come early. <laughs> Why wait two months? Like Hanukkah, Hanukkah come early. No, fuck Hanukkah. Yeah, yeah, I'm this, also this anti-Semitic. Our, this is like our Yom Kippur new year. And this is like our Yom Kippur Australia day. Racist anti-Semites. The, yeah, it's like yeah, it's like Australia Day Eve. Yes. Yeah, um, yeah. <laughs> get to go. Get to go out and just bash whoever isn't white. You know. Woo. Yeah. Get it some sucks. VBs. It sucks because usually when we when I when I vote, like I don't get to make it so crystal clear that I'm racist. Like um, yeah. Like we we were just saying before. Sometimes there's there's two candidates. There's like mm. a white candidate and a black candidate. And obviously I'm voting for the white candidate, but yeah, yeah. it's not obvious that I'm doing it because he's the white candidate. People are like, oh, yeah. well, he probably just likes his policies, but no, no, it's because he's white that I'm voting for him. Now, finally a chance to make it crystal clear. Well, you actually said he, so you're a sexist as well. Oh, so you're a black, a black sexist, female candidate. No racist. chance. <laughs> well, it was really hard. It was really hard. I had a, I had a black candidate who was uh, in like one nation and it's like, oh, how do I do this? Because my <laughs> racism wanted to go one nation, but then they were black. So it kind of confused me. Yeah. That's a, that's a riddle and a half. I don't know. Yeah. That's, that's enough to, that's enough to make me turn away from politics altogether. I know. Um, I know. Donkey vote it for the win, you know, <laughs> just put, put a swastika instead of your, uh, instead of your, your preferences. <laughs> oh, goodness. Um, all right. Well, looks like we've started. Uh, we've started in thick. Um, yeah. Well, so so the the context of all this all this racism is uh, for those viewers who have been living under a rock or who maybe don't live in Australia, if we have any of those. Uh, yeah, we just those. had our on, guys. <laughs> we just had our uh, Indigenous Voice to Parliament referendum uh, last night, where Australia voted on whether to uh, add. Uh, a few dot points into the constitution that essentially give uh, extra rights to to indigenous people, gives them a, a body uh, where they um, get to to make recommendations to parliament. And as we discussed it at length with uh, with Professor James Allen in our last episode, there's all sorts of problems of these with this, um, not least of which stemming from the fact that uh, this body 
would inevitably uh, be captured by activists and would be extremely politically difficult for parliament to actually n- not follow their recommendations, which essentially means that an activist group gets to uh, say what parliament needs to do. Um, if you needed more evidence that this was, go- was going to be an activist group, all the activists were in favour of it. All the yeah. activists this morning are crying and trying to come to terms oh, with uh <laughs> with Twitter the... is cringe right now. Twitter is just like <laughs> I don't know whether to laugh or just shake my head. It's, oh, it's yeah. It's hard. Well, yeah, t- Twitter like uh any of the broadcasts last night I, we were watching ABC. Uh, mm-hmm. I've got some clips from SBS here like the they're so they're so gutted and disappointed and I mean the fact that they are the activist class shows that the activists were going to win out here if the voice uh, did get up. So Mm. thankfully, Australia uh, dodged a bullet here. Um, I think the, the, I don't know, did did you want to go into it before I did? I I was going to talk about kind of like what the, what the voice means and what, what I think the the context of it all is, but I'll I'll let you have at it first if you want. Was that like the greater fallout of, of what this is, what's going to happen now? No, no, not even, not even that, just the, the, the context of what it actually was. Uh, okay. Well, I, yeah, I think I think I've I've made this clear in a previous episode. It was just a big virtue signal, mm. um, and just a way to kind of feel better about yourself. I, I'm assuming they thought it would pass, um, and then yeah, it didn't pass. So they thought, oh well, we can all just be feel better about ourselves. We've got an indigenous voice because I know a lot of people I knew were weren't very informed about it they thought yeah this is just an advisory body or it's just to acknowledge uh indigenous people i'm not going to say first nations um but yeah to to a lot of other people um it was something a bit more deeper than that but i think yeah people are just shattered because they didn't get their virtue signal through and then i guess on the 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 larger scope of it it seemed to be this idea of expanding government a little bit more and just kind of let's put another group in just so that we can add more bureaucracy and get the activist class in or just build up, you know, something that's going to overshadow uh, traditional parts of government. Um, I think that that chat we had with James was, was really informative of it, made me kind of realise a, a few things. Yeah, I, 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 to be honest, I, I kind of probably underestimated how bad the voice would have been until we had that conversation. I kind of thought, whatever, it gets up, it doesn't get up. This is all just some bullshit thing that they are uh, kind of like, you know, the smoke and mirrors of this. This is what we want you to be looking at. And this is what we want you to be arguing and fighting over uh, in yeah. this very, you know, small window of um, allowable opinion. You know, the the whole idea, um, the the Overton window. And on the outside, we're going to do everything that we constantly do. I probably was a little bit more alarmed than just that view when we spoke to James because it uh, actually would have had a considerable amount of power when you consider the, the context of, uh, you know, how politically difficult it would be to turn it down once it is instated. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, I still, uh, I'm struggling at the moment because as as due to my inherent inherent racism, I'm mm. really overjoyed like that that it got up and most of that joy i think comes from the fact that it racism aside it pissed off all the right people like yes yes it, yes, yes it's the, the same way that trump getting up in 2016 yeah. wasn't great in and of itself but it pissed off all of the people that i hate yeah. the most and so that alone yeah. makes it feel like this is a really good thing in reality what's happened something horrific was on the horizon and it didn't occur. That's not a reason to celebrate. This isn't some sort of libertarian yeah. win or even like, you yeah, know, conservative, yeah. broadly center yeah, right yeah, win. Yeah. There's no yeah. win here. We yeah. dodged a bullet, essentially. Yeah. Australia dodged a bullet that um, it's almost alarming the fact that they managed to get this bullet in the chamber and aim it at us in the first place. And that we had to dodge it. And f- for a while, it, it even looked like the bullet was going to, you know, hit a smack yeah. bang in the center of the head. So, that's that's worrying um well, alone you've still got the gun pointed at you uh so <laughs> you, it's not like you've started running or anything like that you just you just dodge that bullet well that yeah that's exactly right and you've still got the gun pointed at you and if anything you know 40 percent of australia is now doubly uh mm-hmm. infuriated and wants to reload that bullet as soon as possible yeah. because yeah. you know n- now they feel scorned 
Um, yeah. So there is some joy in you. You have to enjoy, you know, people breaking down and and um, uh, all the all the worst people uh, being upset at this. And so well, and, I, w- and, I will. It was the fact that it was unanimous as well. It was like every state, the popular vote as well. So there was no even Victoria. I was so I was yeah. I was I, the, probably the most out of it all. Not that it even failed or anything like that. It was just the Victoria voted no and no yeah. one thought victoria would vote no and they did it and it's just like all right i got i got a text message from a friend and she's like wow my faith in the electoral system has been restored <laughs> <laughs> it was it was actually um if you looked at like the map of everywhere that voted one way or another it was um even more so than our u- usual elections because usually our elections there's yeah. some you know, the more some country is is some country areas vote Labor, some mm-hmm. inner city votes Liberal, and it kind of flips and flops. And there's not the real distinction between the inner city elite detached from reality, fucking champagne yeah. socialist class, yeah. Yeah. and the rural, you know, generalist Australia mm-hmm. general population mm-hmm. class. Uh, if you look in the US, in the US, every time they have an election, um, every single state, if you look at like the heat map, mm-hmm. uh, is the whole state is red, like Republican, and yeah. then the inner cities are always blue Democrat, yeah. no matter yeah, where. Yeah. It doesn't matter yeah. if you're in Alabama, New York, yeah. uh, Florida, Texas, yeah. wherever. It's always yeah. the same. Um, and this distinction hadn't really come up in the, in the heat maps that, that the last elections that we had. It was exactly that for yeah. The Voice. It, it, the, yeah. the, the line was you know dead down the middle. You know, if you're the, the inner, inner city, especially Melbourne, and Melbourne had... Yeah, um, yeah. an even bigger sway in their cities. It was like 80, 20 or 70, yeah. 30, um, yeah. whereas other cities weren't so much. But all the cities were blue with the yes vote and all the country yeah. areas were uh, red with the no vote. So like that was, um, I think that was interesting to see that this this distinction almost spoke more to the the idea of, you know, the inner city elites versus mm. the rural um, than even our elections have, um, yeah, which yeah. I didn't expect. I'd, um, I'd also encourage people to look at the the districts and the specific polling places and how they came out because it seems to be, uh, I and mean, I've had a look at like four electorates of it. I, I'd recommend everyone does it themselves, but I wouldn't say affluent as much as like quote unquote cultured areas. So I guess those champagne socialist types, although the where they think they're a bit more cultured, or yeah, I guess they consume. Um, media or higher level media more than others where the the yes vote was a lot more prevalent as opposed to other areas um that you know, i'd say i'd call them average everyday australians even in melbourne um yet to look at anywhere like sydney or brisbane i don't know anything about sydney or brisbane so probably hard you know i, I know melbourne quite well um but yeah that was very interesting and i encourage everyone if you live in queensland if you live in sydney and know the areas look at it and kind of yeah, take the um, the examples of, of where you know what you know about that area and how they voted because that is yeah very yeah. insightful. And another another great comparison is um, like of, of speaking to you know affluent versus not affluent. ACT, uh, you know, broadly extremely mm-hmm. affluent. A- ACT was yeah. the only territory or state that yeah. went yes, and they went so resoundingly. Now that ACT is tiny, but I think they were like sixty five percent yes, thirty five percent no which bucked the trend of the rest of the country by 40 points, you know, compared to everywhere else. And uh, I saw some, like, the the hilarious comparison being Northern Territory went 65% no, ACT went 65% yes. Like, Northern Territory, where the majority of this uh, is supposed to empower, mm. resounding no, and yep. uh, ACT completely detached political class that live in a bubble that's you know made up and and away from the rest of reality votes resounding yes so this well, idea of the the detach between yeah. the politicians and the actual australians was never clearer than in, in that little snippet yeah and it was almost like hey we want our friends to get jobs um, <laughs> so yeah we want to expand we want to get more bureaucracy here so we can get better salaries and then we can unionize or we can do all that type of crazy stuff and and just bleed more money from the taxpayer but hey we get paid so yeah crazy to think that like if all of these people that are gutted and and crying and and so upset that this you know all these emotional arguments are really upset at the fact that canberra doesn't get more bureaucracy that's that's yeah. the actual yeah, thing yeah. that they're upset about is that Canberra doesn't get more bureaucracy um, and 
So we, we, we've kind of, we've, we've jumped the gun a little bit. Let me okay. peel back a little bit first to enjoying uh, the loss of our enemies. So uh, okay. I'll, 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 I'll let me revel in that a little bit and then we can, we can talk some more <laughs> about it. Okay. Uh, so I'm just going to uh, share a, a clip here from uh, Marsha Langton. Now, I don't know if you remember Marsha Langton, uh, like, I know the you know, name, but can't put a face. To well, she she's been the face of the the most hateful uh, aspects of the yes campaign. Okay, she was the one who was f- recorded saying that uh, racism and stupidity, sheer stupidity, are the reasons for the no vote um, winning. Okay. And then she came out and said, you know, it's I, I'm not a racist at all. I didn't make comments about racism. Uh, and then in the clip, we'll watch she she calls uh, the no vote racist again, uh, not in those words exactly. Uh, but and she was also uh, famously uh, quoted saying, "If if you guys don't vote yes, you can never expect a welcome to country again." Which, oh my God, <laughs> please, okay. please don't give me any more welcome to country. I think that <laughs> statement, that comment alone, was enough to flip. I reckon five percent of the vote, five percent of people were like, "Was that on the line?" I didn't realize that was on the line. <laughs> Hell yep. yes. Don't give me any more welcome to countries, any more tokenistic welcome to country. Just, oh, fuck off. So, um, you know, what would be even funnier. I, I've only seen that quote in writing. I've never actually seen the video of her saying it. What would be even funnier if she never said that. Yeah, and, yeah. But because it sounds so much like something well, that she would it's say. The, it's the disinformation campaign. So mm. there we go. If that if that ended up coming now, I, I have no reason to believe that I think she did actually say this. But if that came out that she never actually said this, that would be the single greatest political move that the conservative right has ever pulled in Australia. <laughs> anyway, let's see what Marshall Langton had to say on mm-hmm. uh, on election night. With many uh, yet to be counted, uh, what can we take from that? Uh, Narelda, I'd like to see the final numbers. Uh, I think the numbers at the moment are very disappointing. Um, In the last referendum, uh, the numbers were like that. And I think that um, is often called a landslide. Uh, This is a very sad moment in the country's history. Uh, Australians had an opportunity to recognise us in the constitution and uh, do so by allowing for a, an advisory body to parliament and the government to enable us to more quickly overcome the disadvantages uh, with a majority of Australians voting no to that uh, proposition. I think it will be at least two generations before Australians are capable of putting their colonial hatreds behind them. and. Uh, acknowledging that we exist. No, but of course, this is our second. <laughs> All right, two generations before we're able to put our colonial hatreds behind us and and acknowledging that they exist. Yeah, I thought, I, I don't know if is the constitution meant to do that. I'm trying to look up the constitution now and see, do they, do they acknowledge people at all? Like, I There's thought it's a gaping about hole in the constitution. Yeah. Um, two generations before we put our colonial hatred to sites. I certainly for one hope that it's more than two generations. I'm aiming for 10 here. I'm going to raise my children and my children's true. I want colonial hatred to go into the, the 30th century if I can. Oh yeah. Why not? If it just feels, um, fuel, let's feel more conflict. So <laughs> how, how dare we want to just stop conflict about all this bullshit coming up and yeah. Well, I mean, and the other thing is, okay, colonial hatred. How do we stop our colonial hatred? Because this is something that I have a, a major gripe with. Everyone who criticizes colonialism, and there's there's so much like implicit criticism of colonialism in um in in everything that is kind of said and done um by by you know the political activists. Like, yes, throughout the course of human history, colonialism was not a nice thing. Um, it's also the reason that the world that we have is exactly the way it is. If, you know, you can either complain about colonialism and make tokenistic gestures, which sometimes aren't even tokenistic. It's just a a government way of siphoning money from the um, populace to special interest groups. Um, Or if you hate colonialism so much, give them your property, go back, 
like yeah. give it all up and go back yeah, yeah. that's obviously not going to happen so the yeah. only other things that we can do are tokenistic reparations mm. constantly flagellating ourselves for for the crimes of our ancestors or our ancestors ancestors and the rest is is all it's all just pretend it's all just for for talking yeah. points it's all yeah, yeah. um well, are we going to pay reparations for emotions you know it's like oh, i feel better about myself now and you know whatever where do we stop at reparations? Like if we're paying yeah. reparations for colonialism, what about every single war in human history? Because every single war in human history, presumably mm. there's one side that didn't want to die. There are people yeah. who did not want to die and died in the war. One side yeah. that took another side's territory and the other side didn't want to. It, it, like if we're going back and righting the wrongs of every single thing that man has done to create the world that we exist in today, where do you stop? No, no, it's only with the special interest groups where the government gets to expand that this is uh, something we actually have to do. So uh, just so stupid, that whole well, line of talking about colonialism. My question is this. It's specifically for you. Okay, let's just say colonialism is this fuck off and go back to your country or fuck off from where you came from. Would they send you back to England or Italy? Because would it be go back to England because that's where all your colonials came from or... Mm where you originally came from. So would you go back to, would you go back to England and just be like, I guess I'm colonizing this country. <laughs> yeah. I don't know if you could call it going back to England. I've been to England once. Uh, so well, you're, 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 a, you're a colonizer. So that's where you come yeah. from. Well, I mean the, the original colonizers were the, were the Romans. So I suppose if you, if you trace it back, I mean, not even the original, just at some point, I'm sure there were colonizers before them as well. Uh, but at some point, the Romans colonized, and I think I probably fit into that. So that was probably when my ancestors were the yeah. most oppressive. Uh, well, you're paying the, double the reparations. Standards. Yeah, 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 yeah. So um, I've got to pay reparations to the to the Franks for for taking yeah. over. Yeah. Um, no. So so fuck up. I actually turns out I owe a lot more money than just my hex debt. I guess. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and I'm already struggling to pay that back. So mm. Jesus. What a waste. Um, but so, okay. So let's, let's enjoyable as that was. Um, let me pose you a question regarding the voice. So this is um, something that I was, I was having a heated discussion with, uh, with um, some friends last night while we were watching the, the election results come in. Um, so Albanese has now effectively got a, a, a card that he can play where essentially he he had to to push the voice. He'd campaigned on it. He'd uh, run on it at, at the election, uh, and he could have legislated it rather than enshrined it in the constitution. He chose to enshrine it in the constitution, which was always going to be more difficult. Um, now that it's gotten turned down, he essentially has free reign to. Uh, he's never going to be accountable for closing the gap. Uh, between you know indigenous um, standards of living and uh, general Australian population standards of living, which was always going to be impossible, and obviously the voice wasn't going to do that. The voice was going to do nothing of the like. Uh, it was going to tokenistically pretend to do that and then do its own things. Um, but now he doesn't. You know, now the voice, the gap not being closed, he has. He's not accountable to it at all. He can say, "Hey, I tried. I tried to give you the voice." Uh, the the liberals and the coalition. And the racists, uh, they turned it down, uh, and now he doesn't have to do anything, and he's not answerable to it at all. So quietly, uh, this was the argument. He's he's very pleased with the results of last night. What do you think of that? Do you think that's going a step too far, or do you think that's a, a reasonable um, reasonable theory? Oh, I, I think I think it was a win win, regardless, because you know you, why why you call a referendum on this issue it's so history is going to remember you so he's going to be remembered if the voice passed as the guy who saved all the indigenous the, the white savior uh if not if it didn't pass now he's going to re be remembered as the white savior who was just killed before he could you know come and save them all so yeah i i think i think he's pleased with the result because he can he can now lobby on that if he wants to run for re-election you can say hey i was the guy that did that and he's got 40 percent mm. of the vote right there um i i look i i, I like the theory that's why it, it wasn't my theory this was i was actually arguing against it i like i like the idea you know it sounds very um it sounds plausible uh i am of the opinion that he was not 
he did he didn't he didn't do it with that in mind it's not like he set himself up for a win win what i saw was uh after the election the federal election landslide labor victory um overwhelming support for the voice to parliament he overreached is what i is what i think happened i think he he felt like he was on top of the world he smashed the liberals every state on the mainland in not too much time became red didn't look like well, I, I thought that the Liberals post the Victorian state election were absolutely had no hope of ever doing anything again because their response to the losing the election was we need to move further left to recapture the Labor vote. I thought, okay, that's retarded. You have no idea what's happening. You have no idea why you're losing. Labor's going to win forever unless you literally become more leftist than Labor, which <laughs> I don't know. I hope that's not possible. Um, so he's riding on this wave of you know, inevitability, the inevitability of progressivism that um, kind of used to sweep the world pre-Trump. He was riding this wave and he thought, fuck it, I'm going to throw this in the constitution. I'm going to, as you said, white saviour who saves, I'm going to go down in history. And the what he has created now is an environment where Labor could lose. He He, mm-hmm. the way they pushed it, and the fact that it didn't overwhelmingly win, I think, was a surprise. I think it's a, it's a, you know, um, uh, it's it's a nice aside that potentially now he doesn't have to answer for the voice. But I think he's made his chances of re-election way harder. I think he's made Labor's position way more untenable, and he's given a platform for the Liberals to actually rise up to something they did not True. want to oppose the voice. They really hated the idea. It took them ages to actually form some sort of opposition dutton's initial response was we'll do the voice in a different way if it doesn't get up like d- that just goes to show you that like that can't have been in the you know on on the part of albanese's plan if if the liberals weren't even going to oppose it but what he's done is he's created such a monster uh that he gave an opportunity for the liberals to actually be an opposition of some distinction now as we talked about it's not on anything really important that they've opposed. Like the voice, sure, it would have been horrible, but it's not like they're opposing uh, any of the other expansion of the state measures that actually need to be opposed. But he's given the Liberals such an out. He's given them like a a, a golden ticket to actually being mm. something, which they weren't. Well, maybe if uh, Albanese hadn't swung his dick so much and it was just, do we want to recognise... Indigenous, First Nations, whatever. God, I hate that term. Um, people within the Australian Constitution, or at least maybe even have a preamble and say, like, well, this once belonged to the Indigenous, now it belongs to all of us as Australians. I'd be happy for that. I'd vote for that. Um, but to to make it this advisory body and kind of, the, I think it was overreach on his part. And I think he could have done it if it wasn't so vague and if you didn't have people who said, wait a second, what is this? Mm. Well, and that, that's the other thing, right? It's, is a lot of the accusations being leveled at um, by the yes camp, by, you know, yes voters towards mm. the reason that the no vote got up is that the, apart from, you know, misinformation, disinformation is that the yes campaign was poorly managed. Uh, this idea that, you know, they should have given more details. They should have told more. They should have, um, uh, disclose more information and then it would have gotten up. Now, I think he, again, this is him overreaching, leaving it so um, deliberately vague is because then he could do with it what he what he wanted. Yeah. And so he thought, well, there's such overwhelming support for this. I can fucking mm. say anything. I can throw yeah, anything yeah. in there and I'll get away with it. Um, and so, again, that's an, that's an overreach. I don't think, uh, I don't think people pointing the finger at him uh, for and the yes campaign which he funded for mismanaging the yes campaign is something that reflects well on him at all um but yeah i mean that was just a, a an interesting an interesting uh debate that that i was having and something yeah. that i was kind of thinking about no i definitely see i i see your perspective um of you know it's pretty much i control and mm. now I'll just ram this through and, and it's going to go. And, and by all means, it's, it's a sure thing. Mm. That's, that's what I think his, his instinct was post-winning, post-winning federally. Um, another question that, that arises from the, the voice, 
which I think is uh, probably even more important now. And it's it's kind of the next battlefield that we're immediately going to have to be fighting on is um, we, we spoke a, a couple of months ago with um, Jordan Ditloff, who from the, the, you know, with the Libertarian Party, who spoke about the ACMA bill, which mm-hmm. uh, misinformation, disinformation powers, which are going to be given to, to ACMA, which is a straight Australian communications media authority, uh, regulatory body, uh, which is supposed to combat misinformation and disinformation. Now, this bill is horrific. Uh, we looked into it in depth. I can't remember off the top of my head, but it's clearly going to be used to um, fight for in this kind of thing, where something yeah. is deemed to be the political good and all the corporations and all the left-leaning activists and governments support it. And the only way that you could be against it is if you are either racist or misinformed. Uh, or use you Telegram. Can- yeah, well, and that's how you get misinformed, <laughs> apparently. Um, and so this, the fact that already when the no vote was looking like it was going to win misinformation, disinformation, yes. buzzwords started yes. being used all over the place immediately, suggests that this is now going to be the vehicle, like the fact that the no vote won so resoundingly is going to be the vehicle through which they push uh, this ACMA bill, which is... Um, I would say unambiguously far worse than what the voice would have been. So, mm. I mean, if you look at, I mean, unless you think maybe you think Albanese was playing 4D chess and he said, I'm going to fucking lose the voice. I'm going to blame it on misinformation and disinformation. <laughs> and that's how I'm going to get the ACMA dis- misinformation, disinformation bill passed and silence my critics forever. Um, what a, what a move. Yes. Uh, I... Yeah. Hats off. You know? <laughs> Where's my I... hat? <laughs> unfortunately think that it's it, what it shows instead is again i don't think he's that smart i don't think he planned that but it shows that when the government has st- such control over everything anything can be turned into a win literally anything can be turned into government expansion and this win or lose government expansion the next thing win or lose government expansion anything that happens uh the solution is government expansion and it's impossible for the average person to be completely alert to all the ways that they're expanding and fight on all the fronts because they'll make up 10 new fronts if you can wrap your head around the ones yeah. that they're currently fighting. And so um, the only solution is is a massive reduction, a massive awakening, of, of massive reduction mm-hmm. of the state, massive awakening of people. And um, we're nowhere near it. Like as, yeah. as comforting as the, as the no vote getting up and showing that mainland Australia doesn't like the messaging and generally disapproves of what the government and corporations say, it's no any of the kind of awakening that allows us to actually fight in mm. some meaningful way against what they're doing. Yeah. And who knows what other bills have been up, you know, if there's something in South Australia for Indigenous healthcare, if there's something in New South Wales for whatever uh, uh, police powers or something like that, um, you know, I think, yeah, they're going to milk this for all they can because, yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Oh, and I'm, I'm sure there will now be, 10,000 tokenistic, um, you know, Indigenous programs started up yeah. by various different bodies in various different states to, you know, yeah. to say, to try and lessen the blow of the voice not getting up, which... With lots um, of state funding. <laughs> with lots and lots of state funding. And, uh, yeah. What, what was it, like half a billion dollars that this referendum cost? Yeah, I think it was between three and 400 million. Okay, so not quite half a yeah. billion, but... Um, I don't, I don't know. I, I think I saw... I saw 300 or 400 i don't know who knows when it comes to this i think you're right i think i saw the same sort of figure yeah. i rounded up to half a billion because i hate the government okay. but um you know let's let's call it what it is somewhere between three and four hundred million so I don't, I don't, is, is I don't no nothing collectivitis, to scoff at. collectivitis might get pinged well eventually will if acma passes collectivitis <laughs> is going to be no more but i didn't want to preemptively do that i'll wait for wait for you and max to, to fuck it up well, I mean, if we're if we're going to be labelled misinformation, disinformation, regardless, we might as well just start t- <laughs> stouting whatever, spouting whatever numbers we want, and be misinformation uh, uh, to make our case. I mean, I'm There's already two billion bad dollars at it. spent on it. <laughs> yeah, man. the hundred billion dollars was spent <laughs> on this thing. Um, so, I mean, anyway, uh, do you feel like you got some some value for money off that? Yeah, I reckon. I um, I got a really half decent ABC broadcast that. I watched for four minutes at a time because it just made me cringe so much. Um, I got some nice posters and yeah, it was, you know, 
no, I not to, really. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I got to have to go somewhere and write a little no in a little box. Otherwise, they find me 50 bucks. Like, thank yeah. you. Have a Fantastic. chat to a very nice AEC lady. My AEC lady, she was very nice. If, <laughs> if you're watching and you recognize me, you were great. So um, if you got, I hope you got paid out of that, that those millions of dollars. Um, because oh, they get paid pretty well. I'm, I'm pretty sure oh. that there's a, I've known, I've known people who do that before. I think they get paid pretty well. Cool. Um, she was great. So, <laughs> well, she now knows that you're a racist, so she fucking hates you. So I'm sorry for that. You've added yourself that way. She probably thought you were a nice guy. Well, I mean, there's a there's a 55 percent chance she's a racist as well. So, <laughs> 55? No, 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 55. That that clip that we looked at that was earlier on in the night. I think it got up. No, to it's 60. Victoria. Oh, okay, Victoria's right. Yeah, no, sorry, yeah, you're right. Yeah. I thought you meant the national. Sorry, yeah, I shouldn't drop right. myself. She's Victorian, but... obviously. Yeah. yeah. No, no, we we are Victorian. I think we're we're quite open about that. Um, <laughs> like we talk about Victorian stuff more than anything else. So, I mean, it would be weird if we were from <laughs> fucking Canberra. Um. <laughs> so, anyway, let's uh let's move along because we've we've spent yes, enough time yeah, on, yeah, on the yeah. voice, and there there, there is other voice stuff. Voice done. Talk about. We don't have to talk over. about this shit again. Like, you know, I, <laughs> I don't want to hear the sound of your voice ever again. Uh... I don't want to hear John Farnham. You're the voice. I hope this fucking <laughs> kills that song forever. We never fucking have to hear that overplayed piece of shit fucking song. Anyway, my rant, my rant done. Fuck John Farnham. You're the voice. Kill it forever. That's that's worth three hundred million dollars. It's to never yes. hear. <laughs> um, look, the other thing that happened last night that was that was uh, in sort of local ish news was New Zealand had their elections. Now, I normally don't give a flying fuck about New Zealand. I see New Zealand like the the kind of comparison of New Zealand and the way they see themselves with Australia is kind of how like Canada and US see themselves. Like I've always thought of New Zealand as this kind of a bit leftier, a bit up themselves, think they're so good, but it's actually just a tiny little bastardized version of Australia, the same way that Canada think they're way better in a, but they're just a tiny little bastardized version of the U S that, um, you know, that, that sort of, that sort of, uh, comparison there is how I always view, viewed New Zealand, but it turns out they're not quite as, uh, woke and lefty as I thought they were, mm -hmm. uh, because post, post COVID and post Ardern and, you know, horrific lockdowns and horrific gaslighting of uh, all of their people. Very similar to, I think Ardern and, and Andrews had lots of comparisons mm -hmm. that you could make mm -hmm. in their their language and the way they um, marginalized and, and alienated and othered uh, anyone who was dissenting of the, the mainstream. Um, but in response to that, unlike Victoria, who gave Andrews another fucking landslide win, New Zealand actually rejected the left and actually rejected Ardern and and I think they're called the Labour Party there as well with a U instead of just the the O like us uh, and the the big takeaway is that not only did the National which is their equivalent of like the the centre right party the the essentially Lib Nats here not only did they win resoundingly and they will form government uh, albeit they have to to make a, a deal with someone it looks like. And this is still way up in the air, but at the time of, of recording this, uh, you need 61 seats there, I think, to form government. And between the the National Party and ACT, they have exactly 61 seats at, at this moment. Now, that could change. There could be switches. Yeah. And I think there's, there's other intricacies that I'm not super on top of because, again, I don't give a fuck about New Zealand normally. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But um, it looks like the Nationals can form government with only ACT only ACT. Now, the reason that's important is that ACT New Zealand are fairly close to a libertarian party. I think they get called a libertarian party every now and again. Their policies are mostly libertarian. Um, they're not completely hardline. They, they certainly lean into the more broader marketing appeal. Um, yep. You know, the, the, uh, they have lots of other sort of things to prop up in terms of policies. But if they got in with the, the nationals they could essentially act in uh in much the same way that the greens act here with with the the labor party no and be intended. you know yeah <laughs> act uh and be you know force the nationals to be more libertarian in many ways yeah. i don't know what this would actually look like 
I would benefit from it in no way whatsoever because I don't live in New Zealand and don't intend to. Uh, but it is nice to celebrate libertarian wins every now and again. So mm, again, sure. this is still up in the air because if if they lose even one seat between them, they would have to involve a third party and there's a few other yeah, parties yeah. there to form government. And then obviously, as soon as you involve a third party, acts say, instead of being two seats at the table, there's now three seats at the table and yeah. you don't get to push quite in the same way uh, to for the, for the libertarian outcomes that you want, that you have to negotiate some more. But you know, if it stays the way that it currently does, there's a good chance that uh, New Zealand might have some libertarian things come to it. In the yeah, years. yeah, it'd be nice. That'd be good. Um, who knows? Oh, yeah, as I said, don't really pay much attention to uh, New Zealand, but I did, I did read some of their news articles today, and it looks like I saw a thing on ACT that it's actually been leaning more libertarian in the last few years and there's something they've got like i don't know it's something like taxpayers in their in their name or something so it's like all right cool you're actually going to be representing like taxation and maybe having a bit more of a scrutiny on that um and we'll see what happens from it maybe we'll be taking trips to new zealand because it's a nice place to go mm, maybe they won't have horrific syntaxes on cigarettes and alcohol and all the other nice things that uh, yeah. over here the government says you're too naughty to have it regular the, prices the, they're not going to tax the um the lord of the rings um you know <laughs> scenes where you can go and, and see where lord of the rings was filmed or they'll have uh you know it'll be easier to get there or something like that there'll be private businesses showing mines of moria or something i don't know that'd be pretty cool <laughs> yeah i mean that's did, did you know that um J.R.R. Tolkien, now this has nothing to do with New Zealand, you just made me think of it because of the Lord yeah, of the Rings, yeah. but Tolkien, um, especially towards the later part, of, latter part of his life, um, there's a quote, and uh, you know, I'm the classic me paraphrasing and butchering mm -hmm. the original quote, but mm -hmm. this is more or less the gist of it is that he leads more, leans more and more towards uh, anarchism as he gets anarchy, as he gets uh, mm -hmm. older, because he believes that not one in a thousand men is fit to rule. Uh, over other men, uh, and least yeah. of all those who seek that power, which I think is a is a perfect description of yeah. why the state overall is always doomed to be horrific and evil. Um, and well, you know, the, a, a rebirth of of some somewhere near Tolkien's views in in the the New Zealand homeland. I'm reaching here. I'm, the connection yeah. is very flimsy yeah, 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 at the least sure. between act getting in and Tolkien being an anarchist, but I just wanted yep. to bring it up. So. But, well, I mean, that's that's why Aragorn was made king. Anyway, let's start the Lord <laughs> of the Rings discussion. We'll be here for a while. <laughs> yeah, so anyway, act possibly doing some good things in New Zealand. Um, we had to mention it, so... Uh, good on you guys. Good stuff, good stuff there. Now, I, I, I mean, some weeks I feel like I kind of ah, what what are we gonna, what are we going to talk about this week? What's been mm -hmm. happening? I kind of have to search and dig a little bit and pick pick some old clip of Dan Andrews to laugh at or something like that. And and th those weeks mm -hmm. are fun. This week, like I we're <laughs> we're spoiled for things to talk about because we had to rush through the voice and 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 um yep. and the New Zealand thing because in the meantime <laughs> there's a fucking war possible World War Three starting in. Mm -hmm. uh, in uh, in Israel and and Palestine and that whole that whole shit fest there, and I think um, for anyone again who's had their head under a rock, there was a, a Hamas terrorist attack on Israel, and the response was I think the response is really interesting because I mean look I'm an Australian who's never been there I have no idea about the the geopolitical intricacies of of the Israel versus Palestine and the Gaza Strip and all the rest of it. I know what I read and what I what I listen to. And even then, I'm probably not as informed as uh, I could be, um, especially because of that. I don't think I have any reason to be um, advocating for one side or the other side, or least of all, intervention from some other country, such yes. as Australia or the US, because we're the US's allies and we fucking do everything that they tell us to do. So I absolutely don't think that um, uh, people from other other anyone should be advocating for foreign intervention um, or supporting one side or the other without a, an intricate knowledge of what's going on there. And unfortunately, what we saw immediately was uh, Ukraine went on the back burner. Yeah. Ukraine, largely a kind of lefty uh, leftist cause. You know, it was largely left-leaning uh, uh, politicians and organisations that were pushing for 
uh, support in Ukraine, although, I mean, the neocons did as well. And this one kind of has more of a right-leaning uh, tinge to it, the, the support for Israel. And immediately the drums of war started beating and everyone started saying, uh, you know, we have to support Israel, we have to support Israel, we have to support Israel, um, regardless of the fact that not only is the, the, um, is the conflict there super complicated, but Israel is so guilty of so many things in that area as well. Uh, that you can't possibly say that there, there's a good guy and a bad guy. Like there's never a good guy and a bad guy whole, wholly in, in any in any war, uh, least of all this one. Um, and so, you know, that's that's my initial thoughts. Um, there's other st- stuff I want to talk about. What, what are your initial thoughts? Yeah, and no, I, I loved that all of a sudden you've got a war that the right can get behind mm. um, and almost rally um, towards and and push out the, you know, the the war drums it was great watching the, t- the people were comparing tweets where it was like this war in ukraine has to stop war isn't any good and then all of a sudden it's like hamas has to be taken into account for what they've done and it was just the the juxtaposition between the ukrainian war and now this war that for whatever reason, I know that, that the U.S. has historically been very supportive of Israel. Um, you know, a large amount of Christians are, are Zionists. Um, and there's this, this very big support for Israel, which I can understand from a, a theological perspective. So definitely nothing necessarily wrong with that. But then saying, well, this country can go and retaliate however they want just because, you know, uh, the, the Jews should have control over Israel. Um I think it's a bit much and and we have to kind of capitulate and get behind this or else you're a you're not really right wing or or you're a a crazy libertarian which I've seen a lot of a lot of the right now supposedly libertarians are the the right's ally um you've seen how flimsy that's become now because all of a sudden libertarians are bad people because we're not on their side out of you know you can say at least between covid had these things in common and now all of a sudden kind of shunned because well you don't want to support us wholeheartedly which is stupid yeah yeah i I think um like there's so much that's been telling of people from the right that have that have come out uh in support of this i mean like ben shapiro for example now obviously he's he's jewish and has always been very supportive of israel um but he's kind of seen as this sort of alt-right figure he's not establishment right he's not like a neocon typical uh, Republican mainstream pre-Trump conservative. He's always been this kind of alternative voice of of reason on many topics. He came out immediately and said, if you're not with Israel, like this is no time for talking about both sides. This is no time for defense. You're either with us or you're against us. The most horrific language that could have come from, you know, the mouth of George W. Bush well, post 9-11. Like that's you're not exactly with us, that. you're with the terrorists. Exactly, <laughs> exactly that. And um, And I mean, if you look at it from a libertarian perspective, perspective like what are we horrified at more than anything we are horrified at the death of innocent civilians and that's why a a lot of uh even people within the libertarian circles their instinct at what hamas did was horrified you know wanting to denounce them and stuff but i mean what happens if you denounce them what are you saying if you take a side in this is you're saying implicitly and you're supporting that the other side is justified to do something or to retaliate. And what does that look like? What is the only way that Israel is going to retaliate now? What is the only thing that's going to occur? The hurt, pain, death, suffering of more innocent civilians. So how can you, you know, in good conscience say that, you know, I am for the innocent civilians and then your response being a direct uh, sort of um, endorsement or even support, like financial support, of the death of more innocent civilians. That's what we should be uh, completely against. The 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 whole both sides uh, hurting of, of, of innocent civilians and yeah, yeah. therefore a complete de-escalation and a complete lack of supporting either one side or the other because the only thing that supporting one side can lead to is the death of innocent civilians, which we are now guilty and accountable for. And uh, that's something that I think... Uh, th- th- I mean, there's nuance there and there's lots more that I don't understand about the situation itself. But this simple point, I think, is is it's impossible to argue that by supporting one side or the other, it will not lead to the death of more innocent civilians. Um, de-escalation is the only thing that, that libertarians should be advocating for. 
Yeah, it's almost like um, you've got to have your innocent civilian counter. It's like, all right, Samas has like uh, 500 people, whatever number it actually is. So Israel has to get that 500 people and then we can talk about um, calling it even. Or we have to, you know, there has to be some sort of retaliation, you know. Um, I guess it's that old old thing of eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. Yeah. We have to reinstitute that, which I get, you know, it's, it's, it's prevalent um in in judaism which is understandable from their perspective but from the, like the they, pound of flesh the shylock's pound of flesh well i mean still it's still that that teaching but you know if you're coming from say like a, a christian world um shouldn't you be you loving your enemies uh mm. <laughs> and saying well maybe let's get this sorted out and, and then from a from a, a i guess a secular secular sec word um, you've got things that are hard to say and it should be, yeah, well, why can't we get this sort of, why do people have to die? Um, why do we have to make this killing extend more? Why do we have to take a side? Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, it's essentially what it comes down to the crux of it, it, it is the problem with having a state in general. Like, you know, the, the, the fact that Israel, the state of Israel, you know, which is trying to vie for legitimacy in the same way that Palestine is, they're essentially trying to vie for legitimacy at the expense of the other one because they occupy the same territory, can't be seen to lose face here. So they have to retaliate, not because, and like you understand it because it's the nature of the state. Like you can't have someone come in and kill your innocent civilians and do nothing. Although, that would be the easiest way or to negotiate. You can't do that and then negotiate because you lose face. Although that is the outcome, which would lead to the least amount of deaths of innocent yeah. civilians. Yeah, yeah. Um, so if, if, if there's an entity where the least amount of suffering is not an option on the table, such as is the case in this situation, mm -hmm. then that's what needs to be advocated for, you know, being dismantled wholeheartedly. And yeah. I'm not saying the state of Israel specifically, I'm saying the power of mm. the state and the authority of the state in general. And the fact that these, you know, non-human entities have egos that require the death of innocent people to be satiated. That's 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 the horrific part of and this. Other states shouldn't be coming in and, and putting their warships in or, or provide funding. It should say, well, if, if these guys are going to fight Let's let them fight, all right? If they're going to do that, if they've got something to um to prove to each other, fine. The winner is the winner. The mm. Horrible thing to say, I know. Um, but that's the case of, of warfare. But why does everyone else have to come in and, and just say, well, we've got to act this way, we've got to support them this way, when there's no provocation to the Western world? Um, this isn't like they, they were attacking the US. It wasn't like that they were denouncing anything in the Western world, to my understanding, it could have been something different, but this seems to be just Israel-Palestinian conflict that's been going on for, you know, 70 years at this point. Um, it, you know, every, every, every 10, 15, 20 years, this kind of comes up and this, this, this cycle continues. And it's like, well, we know this cycle and, and how it happens. Why do we have to come in now and, and swing our dicks? Is it the US just as the, as a colonial power? Um, do they have to show their strength because, you know, their support of Ukraine isn't going too well or, or they haven't had a chance to exert their authority yet? I don't know. But I just think this whole situation is just absurd that anyone would want to get involved in something you know, in this, in the the scheme of geopolitics, as meager as this. Yeah, I, I I forget if it's Rothbard or Mises who who has this quote, but the the quote is "war is the health of the state," and which is absolutely true because every incentive for not only the state's expansion but also all the actual politicians and people who are set to make money from expansion mm -hmm. and and this sort of thing, they all benefit from war. So every time there's an excuse for a war. It's jumped at. And we, we see this. The, the Ukraine was an excuse for a war, was jumped at. Israel, now there's an excuse for a war or war funding or sending uh, armaments or whatever it may be, whether it's directly having troops there or not. War is the health of the state. It unifies the people of a country like nothing else to have a common enemy rather than the state itself, which is the common enemy. All of this is, is supremely beneficial. So um every... especially when you fund both sides and on um, both sides <laughs> yes and this is without even going into the the fact that um israel created hamas israel created mm. hamas mm. to to try and counter the lto which was a um the the 
the other um, sort of terrorist organization that they had. Um, and and it backfired on them, much like, you know, the US's operations with Al Qaeda and, and, and all the rest of it. Mm. So like it's mm. it's once again, um, there's there's no clear uh, good and bad guy here. Uh, the only clear thing that is actually being responded to, whether they want to admit it or not, is the fact that the state will benefit and a lot of special interest groups will benefit from this war uh, and innocent people will will die and will yeah. suffer. And that's a, a, a gamble, not a gamble, that's a trade they're very willing to make. Uh, they don't even think twice about it. Um, the, the one other thing, we're sort of running out of time, one other thing that I wanted to touch on was how disappointing um, a lot of people specifically were about this now. Uh, Robert F. Kennedy Jr., who mm. had been prior to this point really good on not only Ukraine, but a lot, also a lot of other things. Like, obviously, he was really good on COVID. He's really good on, um, you know, anti-corporations, anti-corruption, that sort of stuff. He'd even been in talks with the Libertarian Party in the US on whether he would run as their candidate. He's now running as an independent. I think it would have been stupid to run him anyway because he's not a libertarian and, and the idea of yeah, yeah. the Libertarian Party is something slightly different and it's important that that remains pure. But he was at least close enough that they were in discussions with him. He had such a yeah, yeah. uh, good current and he'd be he's had some horrific takes in the past but at the moment his his you know his, his comments and his um advocacy has been really good he was extremely disappointing in response to to the israel thing and i'll read you uh the tweet that he has since um he's since uh deleted oh, i haven't sure. seen this this will yeah, be, so this will this, be interesting this, yeah, this, so this was October 7th. So I think this was right after. This was an, an immediate sort of response. He goes, uh, and this is, this is I am quoting. I'm not paraphrasing incorrectly for once. Okay. I'm actually quoting. I'm oh, reading the quote look directly. out. Well, you're Robert stepping up. Jr. I like to see your maturity here. This is, this is great. <laughs> <laughs> this level of professionalism is uh, something that we aspire to. So he said, this ignominious, unprovoked and barbaric attack on Israel must be met with world condemnation and unequivocal support for the Jewish state's right to self-defense. We must provide Israel with whatever it needs to defend itself now. As president, I'll make sure that our policy is unambiguous so that the enemies of Israel will think long and hard before attempting aggression of any kind. I applaud the strong statements of support from the Biden White House for Israel in her hour of need. However, the scale of these attacks means it is likely that Israel will need to wage a sustained military campaign to protect its citizens. Statements of support are fine, but we must follow through with unwavering, resolute and practical action. Australia must stand by our ally through this operation and beyond as it exercises its sovereign right to self-defense. So, I mean, horrific. That, that alone is, is horrific. It's saying, hey, you know, you don't get to talk about the nuance of the situation. We have to send, we have to make sure that they kill innocent civilians uh, in right of their own self-defense and they do whatever it is they do with the Gaza Strip, which are like the, the horrors that they've been doing there, such as, you know, the, the taking out their electricity, bombing, mm -hmm. bombing places and giving them 10 minutes of notice to escape and all the rest of that sort of stuff uh, as retaliatory actions. Like that's all stuff that we have to do now. And the world must provide world condemnation and unequivocal support uh, of this incredibly nuanced, nuanced situation. And we have to get involved. After his comments on Ukraine and Russia had been so good. And that's that's the thing that kind of doesn't compute is how has he made this leap? He was the anti-war candidate. He was the anti-war candidate, the, the de-escalation candidate. He was so good on uh, um, the fact that... Uh, uh, what's his name? Boris Johnson went and convinced Zelensky to continue fighting Russia when they were trying to reach peace accords in uh, early 2022. He was so good on all of that. And yet the moment this happens, boom, war. We have to go to war. War yeah. must be had. This is a, how is this a different thing? How is this, how is, how do those two steps, how does that standard get so changed for uh, this, this conflict compared to the other one? Obviously, it's got to be some sort of emotional response or you've got some sort of affinity with Israel. And I, like, I understand that as, as an ally, whereas Russia and Ukraine aren't necessarily allies. But I don't know if this is like, hey, this is our, this is our powerhouse in the Middle East. Um, so we've got to somehow support them. Or 
I don't know. It's it's really just stupid the way that you can be anti-war one second, then come out and say, I'm pro-war for this now. I'm going to say it's just an emotional response, an emotional reaction. Once again, just letting emotions take um, control of you as opposed to logic, because I don't know why he would come out and say something as stupid as that when, yeah, he has been anti-Russia um, and Ukraine. Yeah. The, the other one who came out that, that I thought was disappointing was... um. Javier Malay. Uh, now, I don't, I don't, oh, really? I don't speak the language, so I I don't know exactly. But I I follow him on Instagram, and yeah. sometimes I press translate on his things. But okay. he okay. uh he came out. He made he made a post with an Israeli flag and said, you know, we must support Israel or something, something vague like that. And I mean, it's not it's not a statement of saying we have to go over there and have a war. But even that alone, like, uh, you're running for Argentina, bro. Yeah, Argentina. Fuck up and do Argentina things, yeah. man. I don't know how how big their army is, um, or if they're able to afford, you know, sending anything over to but Israel. As or anything. soon, yeah. yeah. As as soon as Why you say, you that, as soon as you say that one side is the victim and is the good in in this conflict, you are implicitly like laying the path for whether it's you or whether it's other entities within the government that you hopefully form or whether it's whatever you're laying the yeah, path yeah. for. Hey, now that we can, now that the good guys established the the. Uh, the the red carpet for war has been has been laid. Uh, so I didn't like that either, particularly from him, even though I've liked a, a lot from him uh, in the past. Do you think it is vote farming or something like that? Hey, I need Look, to I show don't... my support. I need to get people behind me. Yeah, it's... Uh, yeah, I, hard to say. And look, maybe, yeah, it's that sort of, maybe both of them, if I want to be as charitable as I can to both of them, I would say that, yeah, they they thought, oh, there'd be unequivocal, there'd be unanimous support for this. So I'll I'll come out in favor of it and, you know, try and get ahead and come out in favor of it before everyone's come out in favor of it and win some votes here. But uh, I think that's a huge, huge um, misstep, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. um, the only other the the only other sort of with RFK especially with Javi Malay I can't comment too much because he speaks a different language than I do I can't follow the nuance of all his discussions without subtitles and I sort of haven't done that but with RFK the thing that I'm worried about is that this was you know he has realized that his base at the moment his for the for the presidential run is this kind of alt-right sort of libertarian-esque branch of especially the democrats and um that sort of uh group there and he's gone above and beyond to try and cater to them um aligning all his policies with exactly sort of what his base wants um and with this it was the first time he just responded out of uh like instinct like this, this his instinct is still big government democrat sort of all the rest of it and he which he, he has expressed in the past he expressed uh, a desire to to um do climate arrests in the past um and sort of he's recanted all of that but then in this moment he just responded on instinct um without realizing that the base that he's formed is is uh very different to that and uh it's a misstep in that in that sense there i don't know that might be a uh that's, I don't even know if that's a generous interpretation, but that's that's sort of what I thought might have happened. Yeah, I'd, I, I want to hope so. Um, you know, they've these advisors have said, hey, you should come out against this, or or maybe this is something he's passionate about um, and and wants to wants to pursue. I mean, you've you've really got to. I think at this stage, you've got to give context as to why, if you've been the anti-war person, why are you pro-war now? Um, mm. Don't just come out with these words, say, well, because of X, Y, and Z, this is why I'm behind Israel as opposed to Russia and Ukraine or as opposed mm. to anything else. Um, you know, you, you've got to back yourself up. You can't just be like, because that seems like a virtue signal as well. It's like, hey, virtue signal, guys, get mm. behind me. You know, I, I wouldn't be surprised if he, because he's deleted that. I wouldn't be surprised if he like comes out as anti-war now or something or just never talks yeah. about it again. And that sort of fades into the back of people's memories because um but like he's I don't think he'll he'll double down and support it given that he already kind of recanted these comments mm -hmm. um I just think it's a worrying signal of where yeah. his actual instincts are what he actually sort of naturally yeah. tends towards uh we are well and truly past the hour mark we had again heaps to say today so we should uh wrap it up anything any last thoughts comments anti-semitism racism did you not get enough of that out during the remainder of the pod 
Yeah, I, I think I think I might have got it all out. Um, <laughs> so please, I don't have social media. So if you, for those people that might have my mobile number or know where I live, please send your hate mail there. Um, <laughs> apart from that, all good and let's see let's see what the next few weeks brings as far yeah all the all the shit that's about to happen i hope you guys like eating it <laughs> if you have any hate mail for floyd and, and don't have his number you can also leave it in our comments on instagram uh twitter sure. youtube uh spotify and i'll relay them to him the, well, the sure best the best hate, the hate mail comments is liking the show or disliking the show because that that will um that will create you know the algorithm and then subscribing to it and leaving a comment so that that is probably the best best way i to think do yeah it. liking the show would really make floyd angry so if you're oh. really upset at our racism and anti-semitism if yeah. you like the show if you give us a like and a and a subscribe i will be livid yeah all right we'll leave it there catch you next time Peace.